Okay, we'll get started here today. I'm sorry I can't join you in person. Today I should be in Ohio uh, doing a guest lecture in Ohio State, so hopefully I can cover two bases at one stone here today. Where we should have covered all of water and, or sorry, temperature and light on Tuesday. So today we're going to cover water and we're going to talk a little bit about managing corn yeah, water production in corn. Now, as you can remember, we're talking about the five essential elements of the corn environment. So this is one of the essential elements that probably most often comes to people's mind when they think about managing corn, and that is how much water uh, the corn crop requires, because it requires quite a bit of water, as we'll soon find out. And in point of fact, is one of the main limitations to the to uh, where corn can be grown across the globe. We need soils that are capable of supplying uh, a large amount of water throughout the, particularly during that silking period, so throughout the growing season. And this means that uh, droughty soils, uh, sandy soils, uh, uh, soils under high temperature, uh, oftentimes don't have enough water resources to support corn. So let's say, if, in order to understand uh, uh, water issues here in North Carolina and the Southeast, we really need to understand what precipitation looks like uh, in the United States. So that's, I think, very useful in our forming an understanding of, of the water environment for corn and what we could do to manage that. So that's, gonna, that's by the way, going to be our focus here today is understanding this water uh, environment and learning how what tools we have to manage that environment. As I said in the lecture on Tuesday, our hope is to understand these five essential factors and then to get into a series of lectures where we'll actually get into nitty gritty of what steps you need to take during the growing season to grow corn. And you'll see how these link into those steps, uh, this management uh, issues here. All right, so what about water? What uh, uh, do we have as far as a water resource in North Carolina? Well, right up above me, there's the isotherm for, for precipitation, annual precipitation in North Carolina. And you see we're, in comparison to a large amount of the United States, we're blessed. We get over 50 inches of annual rainfall through much of the state. Only the tip of Florida and some of the Gulf Coast gets more rainfall well, you could go to Hawaii. There's areas in Hawaii that get more than this. But uh, only those areas of the United States get more rainfall. Even the, the Corn Belt right up there. You know, the sea, do you see Iowa? I can't point to it. But there's Illinois right above my finger. There's Indiana. Here's Ohio. Look at what they get for annual rainfall in the eastern Corn Belt. Uh, anywhere from 30 to 40, 45 inches of rain at the most. Uh, so indeed, we should have, when we think about annual rainfall, enough rainfall to grow a corn crop consistently here in the Southeast. So what is our problem? Well, our problem is that we also have an environment that requires a lot of uh, moisture or precipitation to meet the annual evaporative demand of the solar energy that we receive. Indeed, that's what happens when we get lots of sunshine. That sunshine falls on the soil or it uh, falls on the plant, and we either have to evaporate enough moisture as that soil heats up to, to offset that heat load, or we have to transpire water. So mean annual pan evaporation really represents the amount of solar energy that we get during a growing year that needs or will require some evaporative uh, compensation. So again, you look up here at North Carolina, we, we are, are one of the areas of the country that requires over 50 inches of evapotranspiration through the season to offset our, uh, so our evaporative demand. Now, you can see we're not the highest. Now you go out here to the west, uh, yeah, you know now why the southwest is a desert. It requires over 100 inches. Uh, they get large amounts of evaporative. They, they got low humidities, high temperatures. That's a lot of evaporative demand. 
So when you talk about why it's a historic drought in the Southwest, the Southwest of the United States is always in a historic drought, as far as I'm concerned. They just you get alive after demand. Now we do as well. You can compare us to the to again, look at Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, anywhere from forty to fifty inches of evaporative demand. So there is our problem is we get a lot of rainfall, but we have it a lot of energy that's required in the form of apotranspiration to uh, offset that energy uh, that's falling on us from solar. Here's the other issue that goes with that. This is um, uh, probably the most major problem. This, this is true in the Midwest uh, as well as in the Southeast. It's a major problem in every corn production area that I know of. And that is when the period of greatest evapotranspiration, remember we talked about annual, but now let's look at seasonal. The period of greatest evapotranspiration obviously fits into the period <coughs> when we're growing this crop. So indeed, you can see annual rainfall. This is for Smithfield, for uh, averaged over four years. This is about central North Carolina. That's why he chose Smithfield. And you can see what the annual uh, precipitation is during each month. And then you can match that to how much energy demand in the form of evapotranspiration we have. Clearly, in the wintertime, we're receiving more rainfall than we have evaporative demand. So no wonder these soils stay wet. Yeah, we didn't have much rain here about a week ago, and the soils are still fairly moist. That's because our evaporation demand wasn't there. But when we get into summer, despite the fact that two of our highest rainfall months are June and July, why, we get a tremendous amount of evapotranspiration demand. This, Like I said, this occurs in Iowa and Illinois as well. So what's the problem then for North Carolina that makes it more difficult for farmers in North Carolina to meet that evaporation demand, where, I mean, where does it have to come from? If, unless you got irrigation, it's got to come from the soil, doesn't it? It's got, you have to have enough moisture so stored in your soil profile to meet that demand. So there's where our real problem comes, is the soil. You can see here there's a profile of uh, soils in southeastern United States. This is a typical sandy loam, Goldsboro, uh, Norfolk sandy loam soils in the southeast. And you can see we got about zero to nine inches of topsoil, followed about from nine to 14 inches of some kind of a, a plow pan or conversion pan. Typically, it's that conversion between sandy loam to say a very sandy, or in some or many parts of the coast plain, it's a clay. It's not a sand, it's a clay. And so, what happens is water comes through that sand, leaches down through the sand, perches on that clay, forms a, a hard pan, and will not go in. So the clay stays fairly dry, or even if the clay is moist, when the roots won't penetrate. The bottom line is, in order to offset this evaporation demand that we see here in the corn growing season, we've got to have a source of water. That source of water is the soil, and how much water our soil carries depends on the, the water holding capacity, um, the type of soil that we have, times the depth. Now, our water holding capacity already, because most of our soils are sandy, our sandy loams, is lower than they are in the loamy silt loams of the Midwest. But even worse, is our soil, we have a limited depth to our soil, whether it's from these plow pads, or sometimes in many cases, we have a lot of it, lower pH in these subsoils, which makes root penetration or root growth uh, almost impossible. So we have a limited bucket, if you want to think about it. We have a bucket that ho doesn't hold as much water as Iowa. In Iowa, just like I said earlier, in Iowa, they have the same, this same evaporative demand the difference is they have a 30-foot bucket. They could get roots 30 feet in the ground in those silt, deep silt loam soils to supply the demand, water demand to offset this uh, evaporation. We do not have that. At best, most times we talk about two feet of effective soil moisture in a North Carolina soil. So we're very limited. The, the old 
the old saying here in North Carolina that I've grown to appreciate from old timers, uh, farmers back in the 1800s, was that we're never more than two weeks away from a drought. And that's exactly right. About two weeks of moisture is all these soils hold before we need some kind of recharge, some kind of rainfall event to recharge some of that soil moisture. So there's our problem. It's a, it's a problem of soil depth, and soil water holding capacity. So let's say now that we've seen our environment for soil, let's go in and take a look at the requirement that a corn plant has in, that kind, in these environments. So we're looking at managed water in this, in this corn crop. Here's a very standard water uh, requirement use curve for corn. Now you can see I've planted back on April the 1st here. The silking time is coming sometime in right around that 30th of June, 1st of July. And then of course, as we pass silking, we're into the grain field and our water requirements decline. So water requirements starts out low. It's a small plant, doesn't need a lot of water. Then as the plant starts to grow rapidly, we get a tremendous re water requirement for water up to about 3.35 or a third of an inch. I just roughly say a third of an inch um, of water is required to meet the re demand, the daily demand of a corn plant during the silking period. Now it could be higher than uh, if you plant at, a, say, 40,000 or 50,000 seeds per acre, so you have lots of plants and you have warm, warm days, you could easily exceed four-tenths of an inch or even close to half an inch of moisture a day. Now, let's think about this kind of demand, daily demand in terms of our soils. Most of these sandy loam soils, at best, hold about 0.15 to point, in other words, um, 15 to 16 percent of that soil volume is, is water. So if I have an inch of soil, we got 0.15 or 0.16 uh, inches of water in that soil. Now here we look at the inches of water today, we need 0.35. So how in a typical day, if I'm using point, that's just an easy math. Let's just say our soil supply is 0.15 inches per inch of soil. How much water? I'll use up over two inches of water out of that soil. In other words, two inches of that soil is going to dry out completely as that corn. So if I'm looking at, say, a rooting depth of, let's just use 10 inches, that's five days worth of water. If I got 20 inches, I got 10 days worth of water. So you can see where that old saying comes from. It has some reality in science. So these soils uh, can hold 0.15 to well, as much as 0.2 or 0.22 inches of uh, moisture per inch of soil. Why that uh, gives us about our 10 day to two week uh, period over which we can have enough water before that corn uh, starts to shut down or, or uh, be thirsty, I guess, to say it that way. So this is a, a real issue for corn. We need, this is the kind of water requirement that require. Now, take that in addition to what we talked about earlier when we talked about light here on Tuesday. When is the most critical time for corn as it affects yield? And I showed you this graph earlier and in which we just basically removed leaf area and then measured yield. So as leaf area, and this is, this is similar. I don't know whether I mentioned this on Tuesday, but it's similar to... Uh, removing water because as water gets limiting the leaves do what they roll up they try to shut down the the stomate so they don't lose water the leaves try to conserve as much water as they can otherwise their temperature increases over that 110 degree desiccation point so the leaf tries to conserve internal water to, to try to hold its structure and if that happens around vt you can see we lose leaf area we lose yield. So indeed, the worst time, that, what I'm trying to point out here is that the maximum time that we use in water is also the same period during which if we don't have water, we can have severe yield losses. So indeed, that shows you the impact 
of water. So let's take a look at uh, uh, water by stages here. As it, indeed, there's different water requirements by, by different periods of the time, just as we saw here. So let's take a look at it by stages. So when can corn withstand drought best is really the question I'm, I'm wanting to get across to you, or the idea here, is when is it that corn can withstand severe or, or even significant drought? Well, this is the period, emergence to V10. Corn yield loss results from leaf area loss due to drought and other factors. So what's happening here is again, either we, we severely stress corn enough, the leaves are rolling up, or in some cases we could get enough uh, damage where we burn the upper leaves of the corn crop. I think I, I got some pictures I could show, or we at least looked at it and we talked about temperature, where you can actually get leaf burning. So that's a loss of leaf area. So this, the loss of yield is directly related during this early period to the loss of leaf area. So as I increase leaf area loss, there's 80%. Gee, that's a lot of leaf area. That's, you remember I showed you those pictures where we cut the leaves off of corn. So there's 100%. Even at 100%, 80 to 100% leaf loss, look at our corn yield loss, only 15 to 20%. This is why in 2021, it was a, that was a great illustration of drought. We had severe dry conditions across most of the state, particularly in the southeast, in the late part of May going into June, right during this, as corn plant was getting into V6, V7, all the way, some of those were already at V9 or V10. We had corn look like little pineapples. Some of this corn actually did experience and burn, leaf burn. Yet, when we got rain in June, we still made tremendous yields. Yeah, we lost about 15, 20% what we could have had, but we did not lose the crop. So this is, if, of all the periods, I'm going to show you three different periods, of all the periods of uh, drought and how they could affect corn, this is a period, emergence to V10, when dry weather or drought has the least impact on corn. I want you to remember that for a test. Here, yeah, I, I, did, I had some pictures. Here's a good illustration of it. This, uh, this actually came from, I think, 2014 when we had dry weather. This corn's just reaching V10. And you can see we've had enough. It's a sandy soil. We've had now it's unrolled today, or at least in this picture. But we've had enough dry weather that it's actually burned. Those upper leaves got over 110 degrees Fahrenheit and burned those leaves. Likewise, if we look over here, you can see. Um, that corn plant's real short. Uh, the other issue it does here, and I think we discussed this when we talked uh, last on Tuesday, one of the first things that happens when we get early stress is it shortens the inner nerves. We don't have enough moisture to elongate the cells of the corn plant. So you can see that corn plant starting to try to tassel following early drought stress, and it's very short. So these are indications of this kind of drought stress prior to V10. Short corn, corn with burnt upper leaves burn. So if, as far as uh, the overall message here, let me take my head out so you can read these side better. Only requires small amounts, 0 to 4.14 inches per day. Soil moisture can be less than 70% before real loss occurs. Remember, it's got to get uh, 80 to 100% to get 15, 20% yield loss. Usually, we don't require irrigation. In fact, last year, we recommended to hold off on irrigation. Now, there are cases, like we just saw, where if you start to see leaves that are getting scorched like this, or if we're really studying the plant, we need to go ahead and apply some water to relieve that stress. But in many cases, we don't do a lot of irrigation prior to V10 on corn in North Carolina. Now, there are, say, states, Arizona, where you will irrigate. They don't even have enough water to get the corn hardly out of the ground. But in North Carolina, usually we want to hold off past V10. All right. Um, oh, and I showed, yes, yeah, this is just a, uh, I've shown you this slide before. But what happens when we get early stress? Remember, I uh, took these leaves off here. Let me get my 
get back in here. Took those leaves off over there at B5, B7, uh, even up to B10. Compare that to the height. There's an un, a, a, a corn row that did not get leaf defoliated. I defoliated at B5, B7. That's all we're doing is simulating drought stress. We're simulating what happens when leaves are rolled up or lost due to desiccation. So I removed those leaves. You can see how it shortened up the inner nodes. So the plants are shorter. That's a, a clear symptom or uh, symbiotic. What happens anyway huh, when we have drought stress early on? All right, let's move to the second period now. Uh, this t second period is B10 to brown silk. Remember, brown silk is R1. So remember your stages here. This is where we're coming to why we dealt with stages early. So corneal loss here is resulting from how long this stress continues. The longer this stress continues, the more damage accumulates. So this says days of continuous moisture stretch, stress. As we get 20, 30, look at our yield loss, 40, 50 percent yield loss. This is up to brown silk. So this is right up to that, that um, silky period. Typically in North Carolina, we've gone back and looked at days of moisture stress in this period. Typically, most years were less than 20. So we're in a period where we can lose 20, 30 percent if, if uh, it's long enough. There are years, um, 2020 was actually one where we had about 25, almost 30 days in parts of, of uh, uh, North Carolina during that period of time. And we saw severe yield losses in that period. So this is that period coming into these critical Three days, remember six, seven, and eight, those critical three days when pollen has to pollinate those silks. And the more continuous stress, the more leaf desiccation goes on, the more stress goes on, the less pollen we have that's effective, we end up getting pollination or missynchronization of pollen, particularly the fact that the Tassels come out, they shed pollen early, and these silks are slow to emerge and receive pollen, so therefore they don't get fully pollinated. So what uh, here's a good illustration. This is the last time we had a major drought, drought across the United States. This is June of 2012. You can see that uh, severe areas of drought in Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, eastern Kansas, and even the coastal plain of North Carolina, mostly yellow, some orange, a few areas of red. This is during that critical period there between B10 and brown silk or R1. And here's the illustration of how many days that that stress occurred. It, it, it set in just around the 4th of June, and we didn't get significant, a little bitty rainfall events there at Plymouth, but not significant rainfall till almost the middle of uh, July. So good illustration of a year. This, like I said, was the last severe drought year in the United States. We're expecting another year coming up here. And uh, in a year like this, by those are the cases where you want to plant early so that you can avoid. So there's April 19th, May 4th, May 6th, May 31st. What you were trying to do is plant early so it would silk before the, uh, the dry weather, we took all the moisture out of the soil. In other words, the sooner you could silk, when there's still a little moisture left in that soil, the better off you were. So this is a good illustration of a year where we, what you need to do in a, in a severe dry drought stress year. You want to plant early. Now, I'm actually recommending we plant early this year. Not so much that I think we're going to see that same nature severity of drought in, in North Carolina, but we are going to see some, some late season dry weather this season. So here are the critical factors. Again, let me take my head out of this, uh, this picture here so that you can see. And uh, again, this, uh, this is where we're at. As far as the three periods, this is the most critical. Dry weather here is the most critical as far as it affects yield. 0.15 to 0.36 inches a day. We would like to start, particularly that 
that last period where we're going from about B18 all the way through Sophie with 80 to 90 percent of field capacity. We did that in 2021. We started with good moist soil moisture in the, in the soil. That way, if we get drier weather during Sophie, we've got soil moisture available. And if not, we need an inch and a half to two inches of water every five days if we have irrigation when no rainfall occurs. So this is how much irrigation would be recommended during this period, an inch and a half to two inches every five days. That's a lot of water to apply to a corn crop. In many cases, uh, we don't have that kind of uh, well capacity in large fields here in the state. Finally, this is the second most critical. So, so the first, the least critical was B, uh, emergence to B10, the most critical B10 to brown silk. And the second most uh, critical is R2 to black layer. Now, again, as we saw with that uh, moisture uptake curve in corn, our moisture requirements are decreasing from 1.1 to 0.25 inches. It actually is going down from 0.25 toward 0.1 as we get closer and closer to mature. We, the leaves are, are basically uh, getting ready to desiccate as we get to, to R6 or to black layer. So we don't need any moisture. In fact, at R5, we already have enough moisture in the plant to finish off grain fill and move toward uh, uh, maturity. So soil moisture, 50 to 60 percent of field capacity. Again, an inch and a half to two inches of water every week, so every seven days, when no rainfall occurs. So it still needs moisture during this time. It's still critical for increasing kernel weight. Remember, most of the kernel early on is, is moisture or water. So uh, it's a still critical time, but uh, it pales in comparison to the need for water during the silky. So this again, I think I showed this slide on Tuesday. This again is a good illustration of what happens uh, if you look at the R1 period there, where we do, again take on off leaves, 0% leaf removal, that's a check or control. 100% would be as if we had a severe drought. And you see we made kernels, we put kernels on the ear there where, on that R1 picture. But what we didn't do is fill them. So they're very light, chaffy, they're small. So the cob size is the same. Uh, the, each of those width you see there on those ears should be the same. But you can see that last one at 100%. Again, you can see that we need severe or enough dry conditions to start really hurting that uh, kernel field. So those, that's an illustration of what happened. You can see a BT, and I again mentioned this on Tuesday, where uh, you completely fail to pollinate while he got his cob and uh, complete yield so close to complete yield loss. So, key points here about understanding the water requirements of corn. Maximum values results when current growers know critical crop stage when moisture is essential. In other words, you don't want to irrigate when you don't need to. It's costly and you're wasting water, a rare resource in most cases. You want to know when it's most important to irrigate. You want to have a good idea how much you need to apply weekly to meet the corn demand. Now, part of our problem here in North Carolina, as well, and I'm going to mention this again, is that a lot of times we'll have rainfall during this period. So that means that we have to take into account what rainfall we've got in our area. Now, if you're in Arizona, you just turn the thing on because you're not going to get any rain. They're using irrigation to supply all that water. So it's it's much easier to manage that. You know how much water it requires. You know how much you're pumping. Put it up, put that much on every week. Here, that's not true. We know how much we're pumping. We know how much it requires, but we don't know how much rain we're going to get. So we have to take that in. So maintaining soil moisture at critical levels ahead of time. We, many of our wells are deep enough or at high enough capacity to actually supply that much water to corn. So as a result, we need to rely on our soil. So we try to lead in, or in other words, get the soil moisture up. So there are periods where we can't pump fast enough or when we can't get the pivot around, we got moisture still in the soil to supply that water. And then monitoring becomes an important part of what we do. And you can see, as I just mentioned, why that must be true 
because we need to know how much rainfall supplied, how much our soil moisture has been replenished so that we know how much water we need to apply with irrigation or some other methods or means. You know, they talk about, I don't know if you've been watching this on the news, they've been talking about uh, uh, that Lake Powell and some of the lakes on the Colorado River there that supply most of the irrigation uh, needs for Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, parts of California is running dry. They're using more water than, than you know, coming down the river and how that's becoming a credit. Well, it, indeed, that they, they can cut back the allegation to growers of corn, but what's going to happen then? Well, corn's going to suffer. Right? It, it, they're not going to have enough water to meet the demand of corn. That's the dilemma of farmers who are trying to rely on irrigation in Arizona, say, to grow a crop. If they cut their water allotment, they can no longer grow a profitable corn, but they got to turn to some other crop. And that's certainly what's happening in this southeast or southwestern United States. All right, so let's talk a little bit. We're going to talk about a little bit about the impact of irrigation here in this next couple of slides. So what does irrigation, in other words, how is, it, is there value in irrigation in North Carolina. Well, here's Washington County in 2012. Again, that's severe here. So we got different seeding rates uh, here. And you can see that where we got irrigation, I see, look at our yield, 270 bushels in a, in a drought year. Whereas without irrigation, not only did we have to cut our seeding rates, and we've already um, cut, uh, talked a little bit about seeding rate when we talked about light interception. We had to cut our seeding rates, but our yields are only 220 bushels. Now this was a this was a nice organic soil in the peat in the tidewater region, not a sandy loam here. So you can see the value of irrigation was what about 50 bushels of corn, and this can, and it certainly changes how we have to manage the crop. Whereas look at Bertie County at 20. Now this is 2013. But the irrigation didn't add as much there. Our soils still aren't holding enough water. We can't pump as much. In, in this case, we, we had limited water resource. So as seeding rate increased, yield went down because we needed more, more transpiration to make the demand. And But our, our value of irrigation did not change. Basically, 10, about 10, 12 bushels is all we were gaining through irrigation here. So let's talk a little bit about yeah, because that's one of the key ways we have of managing water in a corn crop in North Carolina is managing irrigation. So let's talk a little bit about irrigation. It depends upon understanding the temporal spatial changes of water in our soils, and that's critical. Where is the water in our soil profile? Is it an upper level and lower level? When are we getting, how does that change over time? And again, that's related to rainfall events. We need to understand that's what we just talked about, the relationship between water and crop stress, and then understanding the impact of stress on crop yield. Again, we just covered those two topics. So the, the issue now is understanding this temporal and spatial changes in, in soil moisture. So we did some series of studies. It's, these are several, couple decades old now. So to show how old I am. But we did some early studies when I first came looking at uh, soil moisture and re rain uh, requirements here, uh, both temporally and spatially. So here's up at Lewis, and this is a sandy loam soil at the, at the Piedmont, uh, or Peanut Belt Research Station. The value over there called KS, where you see uh, there's a red line at 75%. That's what I call the, the critical uh, level for soil moisture. 75% of the volumetric soil moisture. Anything below that, we start to get stress in this crop. So that's what KS, it's the stress level of soil moisture. So we don't want our soil moisture to fall below that because then we should be losing yield. So what you see here is in 20, 2001, you see rainfall events, those are the gray lines. You see where we got a period from June 16th or 18th all the way to June 30th, where it was dry, or very low rainfall. 
amounts. And then you could see by the black and white bars where we irrigated. We either irrigated, uh, what I call a 1x irrigation, I think we put on a, an inch uh, rainfall, is that right? That's in millimeters over here. I think a half, actually that's a half inch versus an inch of rainfall. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's an inch of rainfall. So that's what you're looking at. So the, the green box up there was where we put in the foliage. The, uh, the triangles up there where we put on the half inch. So you can see we did, where we use a half inch of rain or, or irrigation, it really didn't help us a lot. So very similar to no irrigation. But where we put on enough, we, we sustain that again. Remember our requirements during this time. This is going into silking and then in through grave hill. We're talking about we need an uh, inch and a half to two inches every five to seven days. You can see here we're putting on about twice a week these uh, irrigation uh, applications here. So indeed, we did the amount of rainfall we got early really set the stage because it uh, rewet our soil profile. So we carried carried quite a bit of water in here, and, and that was actually enough to keep us from going until the very end of the season below that stress level. So, as you might guess here, if we look at this, uh, here's where we had the 2x irrigation, 217, 1x, 213, no irrigation, 178. There were no real differences between these two, uh, some difference there, but again, all these yields were pretty good, uh, corn yields. Uh, so even, that, uh, even though we didn't go into stress, we did uh, uh, put enough, uh, stress on the crop to uh, cause it to lose some yield. Now, here's Plymouth in that same year. Now, now we didn't get as much rainfall in Plymouth early at, in that June event, but again, we had that dry period. Then we got some rain. You can see that the, um, the no irrigation definitely dipped below the stress line, even that half inch. Dip. In fact, I don't think, we, I think we were only putting on a half inch, only a quarter inch of rain there. So that's a half inch rain is what those boxes show there. And you can see here that we had stress in every case here. That even the 2x, 170, all of these yields are lower than what we saw at Bertie County. But um, certainly we had had uh, significant yield reductions there. That's what the, almost uh, 30 bushels there uh, from the irrigation. Here's a, so that was 2001, even though we had that long uh, drought period, we had, we went in with lots of soil moisture at both locations. But look at 2002. It was dry. It's all the way through May, in through June. You can see even up in early June, we're putting out, we just put on a half inch each time here rather than the two irrigations. Look at that soil um, uh, without the irrigation, the dark uh, the line with the uh, dark circles, black circles, versus where at least we kept that irrigation, kept that soil above the uh, line there. And you could see Again, this tremendous difference between wherever you get that soil dried out like that, irrigation becomes a tremendous advantage. And then here's Plymouth, similar, even here we weren't putting on enough irrigation. And as a result, we still, both of them suffered uh, declines in yield. No real big difference between the two, six bushels. So it sort of gives you an idea of what um, temporal and spatial requirements for irrigation are here in North Carolina. There's several things that we need to do when we talk about managing in an irrigated situation. We use high, better yield potential hybrids. We want to plant early enough to maximize life interception. So we, we try to take advantage as much as that early soil moisture that we can get and maximize life. We increase our plant populations, and uh, usually based on that hybrid response. We talked a little bit about this uh, when we talked about light interception. We manage air growth, early growth, sorry, if that root development, we manage air development, current weight, and we try to keep that leaf clean of diseases. So these are all things because under irrigation, you're putting more water on those leaves, more likely to see uh, uh, diseases. We'll talk about managing diseases here in a later. So that's what I'm going to visit a little bit about on, on uh, managing soil moisture. Now, there'll be some other tools we're going to talk about as, uh, as we go along here that relate to water. 
And what I want with this lecture was to get you an idea of what how water affected the crop, some of the things that we could do, particularly through our main management tool, which is irrigation, to mitigate uh, that water stress. Now, before we get off of water, there's one other aspect of water that's just as damaged or more so than uh, dry conditions, and that's excessive rainfall. And here's a good illustration of excessive rainfall. Now, there's, a, there's an old saying, again, that relates to excessive rainfall. It says that dry weather will hurt you, and we just saw that, but wet weather will kill you. Now, that they mean that in two senses of the word. They mean that uh, you can drown uh, physically, but it will kill you from the standpoint of also destroying the crop. What happens when we get excessive rain, like you're seeing here, is that this soil saturate. There's no oxygen in this soil any further. The roots cannot pick up nutrients nor water. Actually, excessive rainfall acts like a drought a very severe drought in that they stops all root development, uptake, and starves or causes that. It, I have seen many, many times a heavy rainfall of it and you drive by a cornfield and you'll see these leaves rolled up on a hot afternoon right after a big rainfall. These leaves rolled up and you're going, well, just rain. What do you mean? They look like they're under drought stress. It just rained. Well, that's because it's saturated. Those, there's no air. The roots can't take up water. So as that temperature climbs and those leaves are not receiving moisture to transpire, they have to roll up. So indeed, it is much like a drought event. What's worse about this is it's much harder to manage. We get, and it's fairly common to get heavy rainfall, saturated rainfall. It's many of our areas in the coastal plain, the tidewater are poorly drained, which means that it's slow to get this water off the field, and therefore this water sits for longer periods of time. In the Midwest, with your rolling hills or your good lust soils where that water drains away quickly, these kind of excessive rainfall events are less damaging. But here in the South, where this water has no place to go, really, really, and it sits in these fields for some two, three days, why well, we could have severe uh, damage to this crop here. This just gives an uh, idea of what uh, we're talking about here. This was some stuff put on by Chad Poole in Bio and Ag Engineering, a clay soil and a sandy soil, and it's got relative yield. So you can see the water table as it gets deeper, the depth to the water table, so we get a yield reduction. That's that's because we don't have enough water. But bears, we get as this water table gets shallower and shallower, we get a, a point at which uh, we get optimum yield. And then, as this water table gets saturated to the surface, look at how rapidly those yields drop off. So indeed, the point is this graph is there's a very narrow range where we need to keep the water table. To maximize yield. If it's too dry, too wet, we either way we reduce yield significantly and then under too much water quickly. So as a result, we try to manage these things using drain, uh, drainage or excessive water using drainage systems. Let me take my head out of this picture here so you can see here. So this is a fairly Typical drainage system, you've got that, that open ditch with the drain. That's what those blue lines indicate. You have an outlet can canal here and an open ditch or some kind of structure that allows that water to accumulate in that ditch and flow to the drain. The sideways uh, dotted lines are tile drains or hoe drains that are just uh, shallow surface drainage that allow that water to reach those those uh, side ditches. Usually in North Carolina, these ditches are every 330 feet apart. Now, there's other methods. He's got up there above an alternative system where we can put tile lines. So we get internal drainage with a tile line and then use instead of a deep ditch, like you see the outlet ditch with control, that's a typical deep ditch where they use, you use shallow ditches uh, on that every 330 feet 
rather than these deep ditches every 330 feet. So they're looking at alternative systems here to try to indeed control drainage, even in very wet conditions here. And this just shows, again, the uh, uh, comparison of si systems in 2014. So you have the old system over here on the left, drains 3.5, and the new system where they were able to get tile drains underneath and then uh, utilize those shallow surface drains. You can see the yield levels are extreme. Well, you see those really red lines here? Let me get my head right back in here. Where you see these really red lines over here on that graph? Well, that's where that's, that water accumulated around the, the surface ditches as they were trying to bring off that water. All right, I think that's about good. Yes, that's one last slide here on managing uh, water. And it's just uh, a few points on managing corn after flooding. Number one, and probably most important, remove excess rainfall as quickly as possible. And I'll, I'll put a link to a, a publication on managing excessive rainfall in your uh, Moodle site. But we need, whenever you get a heavy rainfall, we want that rain, off, that water off the surface of the soil as quickly as possible. Then you got to assess how many plants have been lost due to excessive flooding or damage due to flooding. And then we also need to remember we're going to need to replace nutrients like nitrogen or sulfur that can be denitrified or, or lost through uh, leaching or other methods uh, of loss. So we replace lost mobile nutrients like nitrogen and sulfur. All right, well, I'm not there to answer any questions, so this is a, a sort of rhetorical here. But if you do have some questions, I encourage you to send me some notes, uh, post them uh, up through the Moodle chat or whatever you'd like to do to visit. The section that is in your uh, corn eat textbook that uh, you're looking at or, or taking quizzes out of has a lot of really good information. It ties into a lot of the things I've just talked about here. So you should be able to get further information. That's what makes me confident you guys can survive without me in the classroom, at least for a couple lectures here, because I've, uh, we've got that tool. All right, we're not out of time here today. So we're going to continue on this. Uh, so we've covered the third issue, we're going to cover the next issue, which is genetics. You know, the five five factors, uh, light, temperature, water, genetics, and nutrients. Uh, normally, I'd cover nutrients earlier than genetics, but this fit, section fits really good in this uh, lecture section here. So we, it's, it doesn't require as many, much time. So we're going to cover it while we're working here with the water section. All right. Now, this is a very practical uh, approach here to genetics. We could get into a lot of information about how genomic selection works, how breeding works. If you're interested in that, I encourage you to take a uh, plant breeding course. Uh, we're going to just talk about some practical approaches to genetics for farmers, how to select genetics, and uh, sort of leave it at that. Because I think that's one of the, you, you're in a, yeah, a crop production course, that's one of the things that first needs to be answered, whether you're talking soybeans or wheat, is um, what hybrid or variety should I select? And with corn, there's lots of choices. You've got lots of private and, and uh, public companies that offer corn seed on the marketplace today. It's the most widely if corn to hybrid are very easy to develop even for a person without much breeding experience, you can develop your own hybrid if you wanted to. So you see a lot of small private companies or large conglomerate corporations who have seed uh, operations that supply. Pioneer, you know those, that name, Monsanto, DeCamp, Northrop King, uh, Local Seed, Dobler, Hasbro, Syngenta. There's lots of uh, hybrids out there. So how important is hybrid selection? Well, it's the foundation, really, of success in any, whether you're talking, again, wheat, soybeans, whatever crops, wheat, potatoes, cotton. It's the foundation 
of your success because when it comes all down to it, we can manage certain things, water maybe, temperature with irrigation temperature, perhaps by the way we arrange the plants or some other tools, but it's hard to manage all of those factors all of the time without having your hybrid at least tolerate or be able to tolerate some of those. So here's just a good illustration of the difference hybrid selection makes. And we're talking about here, again, drought, water, and heat. This is in 2019. This is the official variety testing site in 2019. And all of these hybrids uh, that you're looking at here in the front of this field have about the same maturity. So when you see these brown, you, have, you, you can pick out their four row plots here. You can pick out plots where uh, uh, these hybrids have already turned brown. They're, it, they have the same growth requirement, the same GDUs to get the maturity as these green ones. The problem is they got too hot and their leaves have already tested. It got over 110 degrees. Their leaf area sat uh, scorched, and they're done. Versus a hybrid that sits right beside it. Here you can see these. There's the four rows of a beautiful hybrid. Hardly any stress whatsoever. Right beside four rows of one, same maturity, that's totally burned up. This is the difference. This is the difference in hybrid. So indeed, it shows that we could talk about the difference in insect uh, tolerance disease. Of course, corn hybrids today, the, the reason corn's so popular is we don't treat diseases very often because most of our corn hybrids are bred with high levels of tolerance for disease, common diseases. Uh, similar in insects with BT corns and others, we got high levels of tolerance for a range of insects. That's what makes corn so popular. And again, I'll get my head out of the way so we can talk about it. So, yeah, what difference does it make yield-wise? Well, <laughs> yields do differ. For instance, I now these I've separated these by maturity. You can see they go from low <laughs> early maturing to late maturing hybrids. That's days to maturity and yield. So the early hybrids don't yield as good as late. When we talked about this, we talked about light. The more light you intercept, the more yield potential you have. So that's certainly true here. But with, so with it, what I want you to focus on is the differences in yield within maturity. So like the decamp, 5808 there, 126. Compare it to a similar maturity, 105 or 111 day hybrids there. Significant 20 some bushel yield increase. Take a look at the medians, 114 day hybrids. The 1464 had 158, the 6435, same maturity. That's 57 bushel difference. Pioneer 1847, 109, 1871, 73. That's what, 60 bushel difference. I can't, I, I, I can tell you a lot of different management practices to try. It's very rare that I could help you gain 50 or 60 bushels in, in a crop. This is how much impact hybrid selection has in your uh, success. So here's another case. This is a pat now. Here's you might say, well, that's under stress. That was actually these are the yields that you just saw saw from that field right down there. The the hybrid I actually here, the hybrid I'm actually pointing. Ah, hybrid I actually pointed to. I put my finger back in here. The yeah, hybrid I actually pointed to. This one right here. Go forward. Is actually this hybrid right here. The seventy one sixty eight. 204 bushels, the highest highest yield in the test. So here's, you might say, well, what happens if we get into a good situation? Well, here's obviously high yield corn here in Pasquate. Hey, they got rainfall here. You can see these same hybrids, the 60, what, 71, 68, down to, was one of the top hybrids. That's what you want, is a hybrid that tolerates stress, but still, is able to yield high compared to 1847 and 1870. That's it. They're, they're under this environment. You were better off picking that 1847, weren't you? It does. And that's true about that hybrid. It likes right. It likes more moisture. It can tolerate wet feet better. So indeed, that did better when we had rainfall. So 
This just shows you how important hybrid genetics are to our success in a corn crop. So, again, I'm not going to focus on how genetics are done here or how what genetics and uh, how that breeding is done. You're going to have to take a course for that. But what I am going to focus on is six steps to get the best genetics for your farm in a practical way. So here are the six steps. We determine the maturity class. We pick 10 of our hybrids with consistent performance. We identify hybrids that perform well in local trials. We go in and, and uh, talk to the farmers and dealers so that we got some local experience that, that ask about hybrids. We look then at traits like BT, Roundup Ready, those are traits. And then we do on-farm comparison. Let's start with this first step, selecting maturity class for primary and secondary. Why do I do that? Well, you just saw why the, why maturity class comes first. Here, let me just back up. See the difference in maturities here from 105 all the way to 118 days? you got to pick the maturity class that will perform the best. In this case, actually, it was the medium or lates did very well. But there are sandy, sandy soils where an early hybrid sometimes, or a different hybrid. For instance, in here, look at this difference. It's like, again, uh, some of these early hybrids look fairly competitive here. So check, selecting the, the maturity. So the selection should be anticipated planting date and soil type. We talked about avoidance, didn't we? And that's what we're here doing. You're picking a maturity for avoidance as well as taking advantage of moisture. Select a different maturity. You want at least two different maturity classes. So you spread your risk. I'd like a, a four days difference in relative maturity and account for market. If I need corn, that, if, if this market will give me a dollar fifty over Chicago, if I could deliver by the 20th of July, I have to plant an early maturing hybrid because I could get a big premium for that. So let's talk about each of these uh, these steps here in turn. So how about early? When should we select an early maturing hybrid? Well, they have an advantage. One of the nice things about an early hybrid is their advantage in, a, in a emergence. They're much better at emerging than a late maturing hybrid. That because they were bred for Minnesota, northern North Dakota, where it stays cold. They, when they plant corn. It's still 40 degree soil temperatures. So they plant an early hybrid that has the capability of, of growing in that cool type of environment. They're best where we have poorly drained or cool soils. They tolerate wet feet better. They do not plant, or you do not want to plant them in very sandy or drought. Because an early hybrid, if it turns really dry, it doesn't wait. It, has, it cannot wait for rainfall. Whereas a medium or late will wait a few more days. So I don't want these on a very sandy. If I was going to plant corn on the beach, you know, down here at Nags Head or Emerald Isle or wherever, I would never plant an early hybrid because I would know that beach dries out. I may have to wait for a rain. I need a hybrid that can wait with me. They're best planted in, eight, in early April, so they need to be planted earlier in the season in most cases. And better when dry weather occurs late. That's what we're going to see this year, if dry weather occur late. So let's take a look at these early hybrids uh, compared to, to uh, uh, where would I use an early hybrid. Well, here's a good illustration. This is on Lynchburg soil in Greene County in 2020. The highest yielded hybrid in this was a 91-day hybrid. This is a site where we had lots of dry weather late. We were able to get in and plant this early in, in April, and this early hybrid did much better. The lowest was a 117-day hybrid. And you can see some of these medium and late hybrids that were in this test. So this is a good illustration. This was not a, it's not a really sandy soil. It's a Lynchburg, so it's got some moisture. It's not a droughty soil. We were going to plant it early. We knew that we had a high likelihood of, of dry weather in, in July. So we chose an early hybrid, or at least planted one of our choices here was early, and that was the best choice for this site. How about a medium hybrid? They're best when dry weather stress occurs late 
in a growing season. There are better on sandy loam soils where stresses. Now this is where I, what I would plant on my beach sand. I'd plant a medium hybrid. It was, so it got whenever I could get some rain, it kept moving along. That I didn't end up having to go clear into August or September to finish this hybrid. So the best one planted mid-April to early May, so mid mid-season planting period. So when what condition was a medium hybrid best? Well, here's Sampson County. Now this is a not this is a a Goldsboro sandy loam. This is a droughty soil. You can see the lowest was that early. I, it couldn't wait for rain. We had enough stress here early on. It couldn't wait. I had a period where that early hybrid was hurt. But that medium hybrid, 15 day hybrid, 187 bushels, you could see some more of those mediums, 159 from 1464. Those were some of the better hybrids so, uh, in this test. Yeah, there, there's some late hybrids with good stress tolerance. I already mentioned that uh, before that showed up good in this test as well. And then late hybrids. Now, this is probably our most often uh, used hybrid class on most soils across the North Carolina. They're at best on very productive soils with good water holding capacity. So they can be, uh, water can be supplied through the whole entire year. They can be planted across a wide range of uh, planting dates, early April to mid-May. They're best where they got contests. If I'm planting for a yield contest, typically I'm looking at a, yeah, a late maturing hybrid. Yeah, late maturing hybrids are about the, the number one hybrid on the Piedmont. The clay loam soil, where you got water that's hot, you're waiting on rain sometimes in some of those mountain valleys. Why, that's late hybrid works well. Best with dry weather, usually occurs early. It's like they can wait out the dry period because they'll slow down but still have lots of time to go ahead and get to silky when rainfall finally comes along. So here's a good illustration. There's Terrell County. This is a muck soil, an organic soil, lots of water holding capacity, high yield soil here in the eastern part of the state. Highest yield was Augusta, 88.68, 200, almost 30 bushel yield there. You can see all of those uh, late, uh, even some mediums, uh, all in that high 200. The lowest was that early. Uh, the early work there, 141 bushel, that's not bad. But uh, it didn't take advantage of all the light that we had. In other words, uh, if, if we could have just grown it longer, we'd have had higher yield. So that's our first step. So those are the rules. I want you to, those will be on an exam sometime here. Now, step number two, identify hybrids that consistently perform well. So I, you know, I want something that works year in and year out across whether it's going to be a drier year or a wetter year. I want something I know I can count on. I don't want to take the risk that it's only going to yield if it's a certain condition. So I want something that has some ability to tolerate a range because we don't know what weather is going to be. It's going to be different every year, slightly by rainfall or by temperature. So I want something that's consistent. So I'm going to start with statewide yield averages. So that gives me a good idea of what happened this last year. I'm going to identify top hybrids to perform consistently across years, or I'm going to use two or three year averages to identify key hybrids. Then once I've done that, I'm going to step back and I'm going to look at local results. So I'm, I'm and typically in this previous step here, let me pop back in here so I can look. In this step right here, typically I want to identify about 10 hybrids here. I want to look at the statewide or use two or three year averages and identify. So and remember what we've already got here. We've already identified a maturity class. We probably identified two mature, primary and a secondary. And then within each of these, I'm looking at these which hybrids perform consistently. And you can already see from the data we've looked at, some hybrids like the 1870. If I'm on a drier sandy soil, it performed consistently, didn't it? So I'm going to use that hybrid. So, so I got to make a list of 10 of these things, and I'm going to look at the OV, uh, OVT to do this. So we'll look uh, maybe at the next lecture, we'll do a little exploring of an OVT situation here to look at this. 
I'm going to use the OVT and I'm going to look at these, see where I can identify 10 top hybrids. Once I've got 10 top hybrids, I'm going to go to this next step here. And in this next step, I'm going to, to uh, look at local results. So I can then take the OVT and I can break it down into my local results and see, all right, did that, how did that hybrid perform in my local trials? So now I'm going from statewide, not consistent, I'm going from consistency to focus genetics for my field. Every field has a different environment. I want the best genetics for that environment. So I'm start with consistent for hybrids. Then I'm going to look within that group of consistent hybrids for genetics that fit particularly well in my local area. So I look at any local official variety tests, I look at county tests, or if I got company tests in adjacent area, or if I can uh, work with a hybrid company and volunteer to test some hybrids and strip trials, on, I will do that to get better information for my local tests. Once I got information that had now I've broken those 10 hybrids down and I'm now focused on just say two or three that have looked really well in my local tests, then I want to get more confirmation of that. I look at, I talk to other farmers, I attend meetings from these companies where they can talk about what hybrid characteristics fit well in my local area. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's how I'm breaking these down. You can see how we're stepping through these steps. Once we've identified our maturity, consistency, locality, confirmation is what this next step does for me. Then, it's step number five is when I finally want to think about traits. Now, as it says in your their, uh, <coughs> excuse me, e textbook. Ah, what am I doing? <coughs> e textbook. Why? There is a difference between <coughs> genes and traits. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me get something to cool my throat here just a little bit. Genes are typically uh, units of code, genetic code, that confer on the plant things like how long the leaves are going to get, how big the ear has potential for, stuff like that. Traits are sets of genes that <coughs> confer on the plant a certain characteristic, such as stalk strength, stay grade, disease resistance. So these are, are I've just listed four categories for traits that we typically look for when we look at genetics and corn. We look at economic traits, we look for disease-resistant traits, pest traits, and herbicide-resistant traits here. So agronomic traits are things like stock strength, stay green, emergent stress on. So those are agronomic. Diseases, we look for traits against common diseases. We'll talk more about these diseases later, but gray leaf spot, northern or southern corn, these are very common diseases that we can have in corn, common rust, head smell. Pest traits, typically we're talking about Trait, traits that uh, prevent insect damage or uh, uh, things like uh, flea beetles, stuff like that. Most of the time, these pest traits <coughs> exist as BT traits, such as for corn war, war or rootworm, or they can be an insecticide seed coating that confers a trait to that, that corn hybrid. And then we got resistance to herbicide traits now today, Roundup Ready, Liberty Lake, Extent Corn, those kind of things. So each of these traits has a, a position of where it's best. For instance, if we're looking at agronomic traits, earflex. We want earflex where we got low, lower populations, where we want to reduce our seed. I'm talking a lot to growers today or this year about plant hybrids with good ear flex so we can reduce seeding costs by reducing the amount of seed we're going to plant. Stock strength. This is always one of the most important traits for us because stock strength means less damage to hair caves. Root strength. On poorly drained soils where we get lots of uh, wet conditions, root strength is really important. Emergence, cool wet soils, organic soils. Each of these has, as you can see here, 
a series, and I'd like you to remember some of these. So again, take a look at the man, the e textbook will display some of these as we go through. Here's diseases. Again, we're going to talk about these diseases in, in particular later in the section, but keep in mind that each area of the state has a tendency to have certain diseases. So therefore, as we look at disease selecting a hybrid for resistance, we want to look at where we're at, where we're planting this hybrid. For instance, uh, <clears throat> northern corn leaf blight. Uh, typically, uh, coastal uh, in a tidewater, gray leaf spot, the entire state, uh, particularly mountains and Piedmont. So this is just, again, an idea of where some of these uh, diseases are common and where you would select that disease-resistant trait in that hybrid. Yeah, here's a good illustration of southern corn leaf blight. It's in the white area. Those are counties that have higher incidences. Uh, so, so definitely would want a hybrid with southern leaf blight resistance, a high level of resistance. There's pest rates. Again, we're going to talk to you about these pests in detail later on. But these are conditions where we would pay particular attention to having a pest uh, a package here, particularly at root work. Wherever we got this corn silage, and which typically is grown in the mountains in Piedmont, I want a rootworm package, uh, whether it's through the BT trait or if I have an insecticide that controls rootworm. I want something on that seed or in that genetic package. And here's a good uh, illustrator, again, the white areas where we see warworm. Now, they, again, I'm going to talk about what well, you can see a warworm on this corn seed if you look really close. So there's another warworm in the dirt right there beside that seed. But we'll talk more about these. But again, yeah, the idea here is to know what pests you're dealing with and select these traits so that we can control or tolerate these pests. There's rootworm. There's a highest in, uh, those are the counties with the highest uh, level of corn silage in the state. And then it's selecting for herbicide resistance. Uh, Roundup Ready and Liberty. Right? All righty. I think that's... Uh, it's, oh, yeah, so uh, I did want to talk about the new corn hybrid a variety selection tool. I think what I'm going to do here is just introduce it. We'll take a little time here to uh, next class session where I'll just go through this tool quickly to illustrate this. But let me just introduce I'm at the end of my time period here already. Let me just introduce it to you. We have this new hybrid selection tool that allows you to come in and start by selecting the hybrids that had the best for each maturity class that had the best performance statewide. And then you can query, for instance, I want a hybrid that is an early maturing hybrid that has high yield in the coastal plain that has resistance to, to wireworm or to uh, uh, southern corn leaf blight. Here's a good illustration of uh, on farm tests from the counties. There's a combined yield from Johnson, Martin, Pitt, and Wayne, and Wilson County, and we've highlighted hybrids that have worked very well in those areas. Again, this is combined with the OBT data. These, this kind of information then takes that general data and allows you to localize it to your local county. And then yield contest, we always publish the hybrids that are used in this yield contest, gives you a chance to look at, at which hybrids uh, have have top performance in that field contest. Again, more information. That's what you get doing when you're selecting genetics. You want all the information you can. Finally, I'm going to have some case studies published, uh, pointed up here uh, that will help you answer some questions. So, for instance, here's a good illustration. This is a uh, case study from Elizabeth City, North Carolina. His soil is a Ponzer muck with 10% organic humic matter. So it's a muck soil, highly productive. This soil has high yield potential, and there it is, as for corn. Harvey's installed subsurface drainage, so he's got some drainage here. He wants to plant early, April 5th. He's worried about bill bugs and cool, wet weather. He has just purchased a new planter, wants to increase his plant population. He's done a good job with weed control as machinery to get to things done in a timely manner. So the first question you want to ask here is, what maturity should Harvey be selecting? He has a good soil. 
which would suggest that he wants a, a late maturing hybrid. And I think that's exactly right. If, if I was looking at this, this high productive soil, he's planting early, that late maturing hybrid would work well there. The only potential drawback to late maturing hybrid is cool, wet uh, weather at planting time. And uh, that means that it's not gonna be the best maturity for that, for emergence. But then he can select traits for emergence, can he? The other, what would be a second best hybrid maturity selection? Well, probably that early hybrid here. Because again, he's planting early, that would fit the early hybrid. He's got cool wet, so he's got early that advantage in emergence that early hybrids have would fit very nicely. So he wants to plant a population, that's a, a standard population there. And certainly, as far as traits, I want emergence because of the cool, wet conditions there. He's got billbug. Now, I don't have any BT traits that will uh, touch that again. It's this something we'll discuss more. But um, so I'm going to have to use like a poncho seed treatment if I'm going to control billbugs in this situation here. So that gives you an idea how you would start to approach it. You start by looking at what hybrid maturities work well. And of course, I'd like to go to that OBT and look what statewide late and early hybrid worked good over this past year. Then I'd like to get down in the Elizabeth City area and see if the county has a county test or if there was an OBT test close by that I could use to see how those performed locally. And then, of course, get onto these uh, traits. All right. I think that's all I've got time for here in this lecture today. Again, if you've got some questions or anything that uh, you'd like to ask, why send me an email or a text and we'll take a look at them. Uh, take a good look at the manual here while I'm gone. These uh, uh, video lectures like this uh, uh, manual could be very supportive for you during that time. Uh, don't forget the exam. We're having, starting a midterm exam on uh, today, and it will continue all through next week. So don't forget to uh, tune in to Moodle. Where it's going to be available and uh, take that exam. All right. Have a great day, and I'll be back on Tuesday with another video lecture for you, and we'll keep on going.